In this video, we're talking about remote controls. So what is a remote control for broadcast? A remote control is exactly what it sounds like, controlling the system remotely. Well, why do I need one? Because the FCC requires broadcast licensees to be able to monitor the equipment for proper operation and be able to make changes should something go out of tolerance. And in most cases, the response time is three hours. For other cases, it's three minutes. So back in the day, radio transmitters were unstable and required constant attention and adjustments to remain legal. Sometimes their frequency would drift and an engineer had to make adjustments to get it back on frequency. Or maybe the power levels would fluctuate and an adjustment was needed for that. Well, this lasted for the most of the 20th century. So on a lonely mountaintop, or in the middle of a massive field would be a solitary engineer who would be there to monitor the station's transmitter and make adjustments when needed, keep a log of the parameters, and note what adjustments needed to be made to keep the equipment correct. As equipment became more stable and technology improved to allow for better operation, and as budgets grew tighter, the need for those manual adjustments and those operators became harder to justify. Early remote controls relied on dedicated phone lines with tones and voltages, and only one parameter would be able to be observed at a time. I came into the industry when dial-up remote controls were the popular way. You'd call a transmitter phone, the remote control would pick up, you'd enter in the access code, and then enter in specific codes to have the system speak the values to you, and it was very robotic voice. Hello, this is the KLMN transmitter site. Enter access code. <laughs> the system we were using would allow you to specify what unit of measurement, and it kind of had a basic vocabulary that you could program it to say whatever you wanted. For example, if you entered 601 on your phone, it would read back to you main transmitter power forward power 100%. Those dial-up systems are still in use today, and I know of one broadcaster that almost exclusively has them for their national network. The downside is that they have one person pretty much dedicated full-time to dialing up transmitter sites to take meter readings to ensure that their equipment is operating according to their license. <sighs> Let's talk about some uh, legal aspects, and we'll dig into the why a bit more and explore some of these more legal concepts of remote controls. So on the FCC's website, they have a page that talks about it, but the FCC calls this unattended operation. That's because there's no one there at the transmitter site attending to its needs. And with today's modern equipment, you don't need it. So in 1995, the FCC adopted the rules to allow for unattended operation. Before that, the FCC required that a broadcast station must have a licensed radio operator on duty in charge of the transmitter during all periods of broadcast operation. The FCC required that stations operating with unattended operation be able to take control of the transmitter and turn it off within three hours, unless it's a threat to life and property, or if it's going to significantly disrupt the operations of another station, then you've got three minutes. A station can be fully automated, where the remote control can make all the decisions needed to shut off the transmitter within the required time limits, or partially automated, where remote control notifies someone who then takes that course of action manually. However, this person has to be at a fixed location, like a studio or a control room. Many transmitter manufacturers now have the ability to turn the transmitter off by stopping sending audio to it. So an extended period of silence will cause the transmitter to shut off. This is a nice backup in case your actual remote control stops functioning for whatever reason. However, I did have an issue one time many years ago where the STL started skipping like a CD, you know, da, 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 and the remote control was unreachable because I made a mistake with IP routing. Uh, but I couldn't shut off the transmitter with the remote control, nor with the STL. So this was a trip in the storm to get it to shut off. You know, fun times. That's a war story I'll have in the members section. The station should have a way of monitoring the equipment and have a maintenance schedule to make sure 
that things are indeed correct periodically making sure that the remote controls meters match what the transmitters meters are actually saying. There's no FCC rule mandating how often that is, but make it a regular part of the duties. However, there is one thing that is on a schedule and that is the chief operator reviewing the logs every week of the equipment to ensure that it is operating properly. And this is done with the same log as the emergency alert system weekly log. And while we're talking about this log, any failure or out of tolerance issue or corrective action should also be noted in this log. It's not as crazy as it sounds. The important part is keeping a log, making sure it's reviewed every week. Okay, one more thing that's on an FCC mandated schedule is for directional AM stations. You have to also log some other items every three hours, but we're not talking about station logs in this video. Oh, and if you have tower lights, you have to make sure that they're on at least once every 24 hours. So anyways, again, station logs are not part of this video. So what do you hook up to the remote control? Enough legal talk. Uh, what do we, what is it that we hook up to the remote control? Well, for sure, the transmitter. For FM stations, you for sure wanna know your forward power, reflected power, and a status of a fault indication. Beyond that, everything else will be really helpful information for troubleshooting and preparation for going to the site. If you monitor the voltages of different parts of the transmitter or the airflow, you'll get a better idea of what the problem is before you get there. For sure, hook up the increased power, lower power transmitter on and off for the controls. If you're wanting to monitor the STL, that could also give you some idea of troubleshooting. Some STLs will give you an alarm indication based on silence or a circuit failure. If you have multiple audio paths to your site, you can add control for selecting which input on your transmitter or audio processor in case one fails or you need to take it down for maintenance. Monitoring your electrical power situation is also very, very helpful. Knowing when the utility power goes off and when your UPS is running on batteries is incredibly helpful. And while you're at it, if you have a backup generator, knowing when that is running as well, this will also help give you an idea of when maintenance on that is needed because of runtime. It will also let you know that your generator is doing regular exercise. Many sites have issues with copper thieves, so having a door sensor attached to the remote control might be very helpful. So what's new? What's the new hotness for remote control? Well, most new equipment these days will have some sort of web interface that allows you to see the status of and control the device. If you would plug it into your network, assign it an IP address or allow DHCP to assign one, and then point your web browser to it, voila, there you go. The new technology that's now hitting broadcast is SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol. If you're in IT, you're gonna roll your eyes and say, oh, that's so old school, but Broadcast is a little behind the times, but many newer equipment manufacturers are putting SNMP into their units to allow telemetry and control to happen over an IP connection. This can save you a lot of time by not having to wire up the traditional meter and status wiring. You would just be setting up your monitoring software to read the specific parts of the SNMP data. Some of the newer remote control systems can also bring in SNMP data and integrate that with your traditional analog and status telemetry and controls. So that is kind of the quick and basics of remote controls. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of this channel. If you enjoyed this video about broadcast basics, look at some of the other videos that I have on there about broadcast basics in this playlist. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep learning.